All right, it is now recording. So just FYI for participants. And then. All right, so one, we'll get started in just a second. I'm trying to actually figure out how to pull up the chat again. Here we are. So, so everybody that is on, uh, we're using a software called Nearpod. And if you go to the link that I just put into the chat box, that has that will give you access to the lesson. Now, the lesson will be on our share screen, but the reason we use this is because it is very interactive and I think it will just be a better experience for you. But if for whatever reason you can't access the lesson um, or, you know, you just want to follow along on my screen, that's totally fine. Um, so we have the link and here is the code and I will get started for us. So my name is Emily Callen. I'm the Community Food Equity Manager at Dayton Children's Hospital. I run the teaching kitchen that's there. And then alongside with me is Kylie Yike. Kylie Yike, we're gonna jump right into our presentation, is a pediatric dietitian who has worked for Dayton Children's for over two years now. She specializes in infant and toddler nutrition, picky eating and eating disorders. Um, she has two children of her own and she has also struggled with picky eating. So she is, she knows um, what it's like to be in your shoes as a caregiver with uh, small children. I have learned almost everything I know about picky eating from Kylie. Um, all of my best ideas have come from her. And, um, you know, so, so she really knows what she's talking about and she'll really take over most of the presentation here. I'm just here to make things run smoothly. And then just like I said, um, I'm the food equity manager. So we have a teaching kitchen at the hospital. Of course, it's been closed since COVID, um, but we have been doing some of this virtual programming and I can absolutely share resources with Amy to pass on um, to everybody that's here if you're interested in more virtual programming. We did get clearance to open up our kitchen in this next month or so. Um, so we will have some live events that you can look out for on our events page on Dayton Children's Hospital. And my job is really learning, helping kids learn how to cook. Everything's very hands-on um, and building those good mealtime habits. So I'm gonna let Kylie take over from here. And of course I'll mute myself so we can minimize any feedback and we'll go from there. Thanks so much. Yeah, hi Emily, thanks for that great introduction. And um, like you said, I have uh, two toddlers Definitely struggled with picky eating. My oldest was just around, just over the age of two when I started working at Dayton Children's. And so right at the prime time of learning about how to implement some of the strategies we'll be talking about today. Um, I also have a husband and a dog that are also picky eaters. So, you know, I, I've seen it all. <laughs> um, so I, I really want to stress before we get started that picky eating is so, so normal. Um, you are not doing anything wrong as a parent or as a caregiver because your child is picky. Please remember that through this whole thing. This is so normal. And as we talk about development and a child's cognitive ability to understand, it really makes a lot more sense. Um, and you can see here, you know, the eating experience is not just about how the food tastes. There are so many other factors that are involved with eating. And that's why we call it an experience because it's not just about we put food at the table and we eat it. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into, you know, shaping your child's eating habits and, um, you know, setting expectations surrounding meals. Okay. Oh, this is so, great. Okay. Yeah, our first yeah, question our first today. Question so if today, you're so on Nearpod, you'll um, it'll look a little bit different. But our our first question is just so we know what are the ages of the the kids that are here, um, or for the the caregivers that are here. And for any of you who um, are not on Nearpod, feel free to just shout it out. And we'll wait maybe just another minute or two for those of you still answering, but it looks like a majority of the ages are um, 
around that two to five range it looks like we've got a few in like the six to ten but for the most part they're in that uh kind of toddler range we have um, a three and a seven year old too. seven year old too sorry okay sorry perfect yeah so um and what i will kind of preface all of this by saying is a lot of these strategies we want to implement this for all ages you may find that some of it is a little bit more feasible feasible excuse me with um, the younger ages just because you have a little bit more control over um, their access to food um, you know an older child that can reach into the pantry and get their food out themselves it makes it a little bit more challenging but um, i encourage all of these for any age range okay yeah so feel free to submit your answers for this one as well what successes have you had introducing new foods to your kids. If you have any, please feel free to share. I'll give maybe one more minute. And I also wanted to I point out to that, point that, uh, that uh, the moderator the said, moderator feel free to add it to the chat as well. Okay. So it looks like one of the answers up here, um, when I only make them take one bite instead of a whole meal in front of them. Okay. And then, oh, it looks like my four-year-old is willing to try any food and refuses very few. So that's great. Okay. So we've got a few different answers here. Um, maybe one more minute, see if anyone's still finishing up typing. And then we can move on to our next question. It looks like... Um, I, I got a uh, something in the chat box um, from somebody else who wrote they've added a few things into muffins and scrambled eggs. So things like quinoa and um, cauliflower rice or diced veggies, which is a great idea. Okay, so what kind of struggles have you had introducing new foods to your kids? And again, feel free if you aren't able to do it in Nearpod, put it in the chat as well. Okay, I'm going to take a few notes on some of these um, for struggles. Hopefully I can answer a lot of these questions as we go through, but it looks like we have missed meals, a lot of tears, um, you know, maybe some negative comments back, refusing to eat. Um, I'm seeing a lot, a lot of common answers here um, of things that I've heard through my practice as well. So, um, you know, spitting things out, gagging. These are all really common um, responses. Okay. And Emily, there is one right below Sarah that I didn't see. I apologize, it wouldn't let me scroll down. Okay. I think that's pretty common too. Most people say vegetables are like the hardest thing. So, okay, feel free, next slide. So here's our goals for today. Um, and I think we already went through these a little bit. Really, I wanna help you learn some things to try so that the meal time isn't so stressful. We don't feel so anxious when we come to a meal and it doesn't feel like a fight all the time. And then hopefully help you troubleshoot any of the problems that you're having. And I appreciate you sharing all of those struggles in that last slide. And maybe give you some ideas or things to do at home, um, not just at meal time, but outside of meals in order to make food fun and kind of encourage kids to be not so afraid of certain foods. All right, 
So this slide right here, um, we're going to talk a little bit about this concept called the division of responsibility. And this was created by Ellen Satter, and you can see her name down at the bottom there, and that's her website if you want to go to it. She is a dietitian. She's also a social worker. She has been working in this field of feeding, um, the philosophy of feeding children for many, many, many years. She's considered the expert and the division of responsibility is considered the gold standard when we think about how to feed children. And it really sets, it kind of sets up the stage for what is everybody's role and responsibility at a meal? And I'll go through this and kind of explain this to you right now, and then we can talk about it as we go through, because I think when I have some specific examples, it can help make this seem uh, more applicable. So when we think about a meal, we think about what is the parent responsible for and what is the child responsible for? And so as a parent, your job is to choose what food is going to be served, you choose when that food will be served, and you choose where it's going to be served at. And then you also choose what the portion size of those foods will be. The child is only responsible for, of what is served to them, how much they're gonna eat and whether they're gonna eat or not. And I think the key thing in that is if they're going to eat or not and, and not eating is okay. Um, and by doing this, the parent has control over the meal situation, control over the meal environment, the meal schedule, but the child also feels that they have the freedom to make choice themselves. You know, I can choose what I'm going to eat here. I can choose to listen to my hunger and fullness cues, and I can choose to stop eating when I, when I feel ready to. Um, so always keep this in mind. Like I said, this is sort of the foundation philosophy for all of these tips and suggestions that we're going to be talking about going forward. Um, and I will bring them back in as we're talking. So by following the division of responsibility, we're really setting up a consistent meal schedule. I think that's the first and most important thing to keep in mind. A child that has access to sort of pick and graze and snack all day, it doesn't really set them up to have good hunger and fullness cues. And, and I encourage you to kind of think about if you've ever been in a situation where uh, maybe you're at a party or a gathering and there's food out everywhere um, and you're just sort of standing at the food table and you're just nibbling on food here and there all day. You're not really hungry for a full meal or if it comes time for that meal, you really don't eat very much because you're not really that hungry. You've been sort of eating all day. And so when we let kids sort of snack and graze all day, they they don't set up that good hunger and fullness and specifically come to a meal at the appropriate hunger level in order to be motivated to eat an appropriate portion of food at that time. Um, and, you know, the other important thing is that um, keep in mind drinks too. So not just food, but kids who are allowed to drink calorie containing drinks. So juice, milk, um, or anything else that is has calories, we want that to be at meal times only. So if you've got a child who, you know, has a glass of milk 20 minutes right before their meal, that's going to affect how hungry they are at that meal as well. So we really want to think about what's our meal schedule, what's our drink schedule, and when are we offering all of those things. Hunger is a really good motivator. And I don't say that in the sense that, um, you know, we're going to starve your child out. That's <laughs> definitely not what I'm saying. Um, but a child with hunger is more likely to try a food that is put in front of them. Um, and by doing all of these things, you know, you're just really setting the ground rules for what the expectation of a meal is. And over time, it can help reduce that conflict at a meal, that feeling of like every meal is a battle and and i'm just i don't even want to come to the table because i know it's going to be a fight trying to get my child to eat you know if we set up these rules it really helps them to understand okay this is this is the expectation these are my expectations and then we just go from there um 
So here's one thing I'm going to say, though. Um, all of these tips and suggestions oftentimes don't work right away. Um, sometimes they do, but a lot of times, really what we're trying to do is adjust a habit, change a behavior, and that doesn't happen right away. And I kind of equate that to really any other transition or any type of behavior change you're trying to make with your child. I remember uh, my youngest, she um, really, really loved her pacifier. And when we tried to get rid of that, man, was that hard. And, and I kind of equate this to the same way because we saw a lot of the behaviors, you know, a lot of crying, a lot of tantrums, a lot of fits. And it, and it was because, you know, we were changing a habit and she didn't want that habit changed. Um, and so you're going to have some battles and some struggles before it gets better. So always keep that in mind. Um, and, and just to reference back to that division of responsibility really quick and to kind of put into perspective why we're thinking about this as an eating experience and why we're thinking about this as behavior change is um, sometimes picky eating can evolve be because there's a breakdown in what the goals for both the parent and the child are. And so a lot of times what I see is parents will um, you know, be solely focused on the nutrition for their child, which there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> That's your job as a parent is to worry about your child's nutrition and your child's growth. But sometimes we get so tunnel visioned onto that, we, we kind of forget about everything else surrounding that meal experience. On the flip side, your child does not have the cognitive reasoning and cognitive development to be able to understand this idea of healthy and unhealthy. There's a multitude of food choices. I have to be willing to eat some things that aren't my number one top favorite. They don't understand that. What they understand with a meal is, I like chicken nuggets better than I like peas. What do I have to do to eat less peas and more chicken nuggets? That's all they understand. And so the, it, it turns into this kind of hamster wheel where the child is in front. They're the one leading the hamster wheel and we're just running behind them because we're like, oh, my child's not eating. Oh, my child's only eating chicken nuggets. How do I get them to eat peas? And we're doing all these things to cater to this child based on their behavior. When if we can stop and say, oh, wait a minute, do I need to set some ground rules around the schedule, around the environment, around the quantity of the food served and what is served at that meal? And maybe take back a little bit of that control. Now I'm going to lead this hamster wheel and then your child will follow along. So um, hopefully that kind of helps you understand where a lot of these suggestions are coming from in order to really make some positive change over time. All right, so here we're gonna talk a little bit about um, just some things that might get in the way of being able to implement the a consistent meal schedule and really this idea of the division of responsibility. And one big one is really making sure that your child is seated in an ergonomically appropriate position. Um, we want that child sitting at the table, whether it be in a booster seat, a high chair, um, some kind of seated position where they're in this 90, 90, 90. You know, our hips are bent at a 90 degree angle, our knees are bent at a 90 degree angle, and then they also have somewhere to prop their feet. And the reason for this is if that child's kind of a wiggle worm at the table, has a hard time getting into a comfortable position. You know, maybe the, the table is kind of at an eye level where it's too high. So it's hard for me to reach my food. It's hard for me to get to the things that I want. I can't really see what I'm eating. Um, or they might be sitting in a position where their head is tilted the wrong way. You know, maybe I'm sitting too high and now I got to bend my head down to eat. But imagine trying to eat with your head bent down. You know, now I can't really breathe very well doing that. So it's all about, let's just put them in a position where they're going to be most successful. There's not as many of those distractions of trying to be comfortable. I can see the food. I can reach it easily. I can get to it in the best, most comfortable way. So always making sure that your child is there in a comfortable, ergonomically appropriate position. And like I said, at the meal table. So we really want that child to be watching and observing everybody else around them. Um, I'm sorry, Alexa, turn off.
Sorry. <laughs> I apologize about that. Um, so let me think about where I was at. Oh, yes. We want them at the table as well. So um, what I've seen sometimes is that parents will get like a little um, kid size table and kid size chairs. You know, that's at their size. That's at their height. And that's great. That is such a good resource. But the problem is now they're not sitting with you. They can't watch you eat. They can't learn by example. And so keep that table. Don't get rid of it. Use it for crafts. Use it for coloring but bring them to the table with you so that they can watch you eat. Um, and I think especially at these younger toddler ages, they're spending more time at home most often than they are out somewhere else. More meals are around parents and other siblings. So you're really the main person showing by example what our expectations are. Okay, uh, the next thing is um, really looking at, I like this picture here, Talking about portion size expectation, um, I, th I think it's really easy to put bigger portions of food on a plate for a child um, and not really know kind of how much to give them. Um, so their, their expected portion sizes can be smaller than definitely what an adult would eat. Now, that doesn't mean that a toddler couldn't eat two or three times the amount of food that's in this picture or eat less than that. You know, for kids, the expectation really can be kind of all over the place. But just keep in mind, they may not eat as much as what you expect them to eat. Their portion might be smaller than your expectation. So putting the food down in front of them, and then if they don't finish it, that's okay. They can have the freedom to stop because they're full. And also looking at what are the portions of each individual food item at a meal? So a lot of times what I see is a parent might serve, I'm gonna use chicken nuggets and peas again. A parent might serve that child, you know, six chicken nuggets and some, you know, a uh, quarter of a cup of peas. Well, if that child is full off of six chicken nuggets, they're gonna eat all six of those nuggets and they're not even gonna look at the peas. I'm full, I'm done, I don't wanna eat anymore. As a parent, we're gonna think, well, you didn't eat any of your veggies. You don't like veggies. Eat more of these veggies. Here's a little thing that you could adjust. Give them three chicken nuggets and then give them the peas. Yes, they are gonna eat those three chicken nuggets and then they're gonna to turn to you and say, I'm still hungry, I want more. And your answer back is, there's still food on your plate. If you're hungry, you can choose to eat what's there. If you're not, you can choose to be done with that meal. But just know that if you're hungry later, what you leave on this plate is what you get to eat later. And so really just setting that, going back to that division of responsibility. Not only are you responsible for what food is served, but the portion size of that food. And so we don't wanna overdo it on the favorites. They are not gonna be hungry to eat the foods that aren't the favorites. And, um, and then it's just gonna feel like a battle because you can't ever get them to eat them. Um, all right. And then you can see kind of the last point on here. We talked about that a little bit already, really making sure that milk or juice or any other calorie containing beverages, those are at mealtime only. And then it's unlimited access to water in between meals, um, just so that those calorie containing drinks aren't interfering with hunger coming into that mealtime. All right. Oh, so, Kylie, I wanted, oh, Kylie, I wanted you to a talk a little bit about the, the, the first the point, first too. point yep. too. Yep. Yep. I was just coming to that. Yeah. I think this is a really, really huge point to hit on. Um, making sure everybody's on the same page as far as what are we, what are the strategies that we're implementing? And it, it could be any variety of situations, whether it's, um, a you know a family where both parents are in the home but we're all sitting down to the meal together and that the two parents aren't agreeing on how to approach that child at that meal and i can tell you i still struggle a little bit with getting my husband on board with some of these things so that one right there is a huge one for me that i still am working on because i will catch my husband say oh just have one more bite just eat one more bite i'll give you this if you have one more bite well, wait a second <laughs> that we're not we're not doing any of that um you know so i how do then i respond at that meal so really just having these conversations outside of the meal time with um you know if there is shared parenting in the home 
how are we addressing this? Now, if they're shared parenting in two separate homes, same thing, you know, can we be on the same uh, plan, on the same schedule? That way we're not flipping back and forth between homes and the rules are different. And this can apply to grandparents or to any other caregiver out there. I struggle with this one too, because my parents show their love by feeding. <laughs> That's their love language. And so it's it's really hard because then they'll spend a day or two with their grandparents and then come home. And it's like everything we've worked on has been derailed. Um, so as much as you can, trying to get everyone who spends a significant amount of time in that child's life to be on the same page as much as you possibly can is is really helpful. And then one more thing. Um, Back on just some of the, I'm sorry, Emily, I should have told you to hang out at that last slide. Um, one more thing is that at a meal, you know, we really want to try to focus on removing any sort of negative conversation or acknowledging any negative behaviors. And I know that's not written up on here, but, um, you know, if you kind of think about what's happening at that meal, if I put in front of my child something that I know they're not going to eat, what what do I expect them to say back to me? And I did see a few of you say some of your struggles, you know, your child will cry, they'll throw a tantrum, they'll spit it out, they'll say, ew, that's gross. So you're seeing that's that behavior response. I know this is a food I don't want to eat. I'm already ready to go. This is the response that I'm going to give back to you. And if you think about, okay, what am I doing back to that behavior response? If you're saying back to them, no, you have to have it. No, just have one bite. You can't get up from the table until you're done eating. You're still giving attention to that negative behavior. Whether it's still negative feedback, they are still getting attention from that behavior. And the bottom line is you cannot force your child to eat. You physically can't make them swallow. It is not something you can do. So the bottom line is they have control over what they are going to eat. So if we remove the conflict, so if your child starts saying, ew, that's gross, I don't like that, starts doing the gagging, we really try and avoid acknowledging any of that at all. Just ignore it. You know, if you put the file down and they're like, ew, that's gross, don't say anything. And then just say, well, how was your day at school today? Um, you know, don't give them any attention to the things that have gotten them attention before. And it's going to help you over time feel better too. It's going to be a struggle initially because you just want to be, you know, say something back to them, but just ignore it. They will learn that that behavior response is not going to get them what they want over time. Okay, next slide. I'm ready. All right. So here's some signs that it's working. Um, and you probably notice here that there's not a point on there that it says my child eats everything that I put in front of them. I mean, that would be great, and that is a good sign that it's working, but you are likely going to see some of these other steps first before you fully get there. Um, if your child can't even stand to have broccoli on their plate, the minute that plate sits down, they have to pull the broccoli off. If your child can leave the broccoli on the plate, great. That's a great sign that it's working because now they don't have to remove it from their site. Or say they never touched it, wouldn't even look at it, wouldn't acknowledge it. But now you're noticing out of the corner of your eye, they're touching it, they're pushing it with their fork, they're squishing it. Okay, like we're, we're bringing this food in a little bit. It, it might seem really slow, but they're giving it some attention. They're recognizing it. Um, even things like bringing it to their mouth, licking it, smelling it, um, putting it in their mouth, even if they spit it back out, I'm okay with it being in their mouth because that's one step closer to chewing it, which is one step closer to swallowing it. So the idea of eating, there are so many steps and so many sensory processes that go into eating that it's not, not just chew and swallow and I'm done. You know, we eat with our eyes. So visually we're looking at everything. We eat with our sense of smell. So if some, something isn't appealing as far as smell, um, definitely with um, our sense of touch, um, not only how it feels on your hands, but how does it feel in your mouth? And and you can, you know, if you think about eating different foods, you can tell like, you know, 
I don't know, chips sometimes that can kind of, if you don't chew them really well, tear up the inside of your mouth or, you know, sometimes things that are like really sour can kind of feel weird on your tongue. And, you know, there's so much texture involved. Um, and then taste is in there too, obviously, but there's so much more to that. Um, and even just that sense of curiosity. And I really like bringing kids into the meal to help them with cooking or prepping. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but you can kind of see number three there. You know, if they're curious about a food, if they want to help you prepare the meal, if they want to kind of play with that food, that that's great. That's a great way to get them involved. And then also too, when meals feel less stressful, that's, that's a sign that things are working. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a personal example, especially for this number three here. Um, Again, for my oldest, who I really struggle with the picky eating, um, we were making, um, I think we were probably making fajitas or something for dinner, and I was chopping up peppers, you know, red and yellow peppers, and I had him come over and help me once I was done chopping and I put my knife away. I said, can you move these from my cutting board to my pan? And as he was moving them, I said, hey, what do you, do you, could you be my taste tester here? Tell me if these are okay. I'll do it with you. And you know, he like took a little nibble off the corner and then moved on, you know, oh yeah, I think those are fine. I'm like, oh great, thanks for your help. You know, so I'm not even like asking him the sense of eat it because I want you to, but you know, the, your special job is to be my taste tester. And the next time we had peppers, I noticed he had a little nibble by himself. And then he said, mom, they're okay this time again. I'm like, great, thanks for being my little taste tester. And then we just moved them. And one of the times we, had um i was like well let's let's look at this here can you break this pepper in half did it make a sound listen put it up by your ear break it in half you know you can hear it kind of crisp and crunch as you break it i'm like what does the outside of this feel like is it slimy is it slippery is it bumpy you know what does the inside feel like um what does it smell like so we're going through all of these senses as we're playing with this food as we're prepping for that meal and I will tell you now, okay, so he was two then, he's almost five now. Peppers are his favorite vegetable. So I'm like, okay, finally, <laughs> we got somewhere with this. So it took a lot of time and it, you know, it meant the meal was a little bit slower because I had to bring him in and, and help me out. But now he enjoys that food and it was well worth the time put into it by just acknowledging this food in a different way. Oh, and then Emily, feel free. I'm going to mute myself. Yeah, I was going to say, um, if I can, if you guys can let me know if you can't hear it, um, but I believe we should be able to, it should share the sound as well. No, we can't hear you, Emily. Eaters and going through a couple tips to help you improve the eating habits of your kids at home. So, so the first point that I want to make is all about 
we can hear you, but I can't see the video now. Hi everybody, my name is Emily Kahn. I'm the Community Food Equity Manager here at Dayton Children's Hospital. And today we are talking about picky eaters and going through a couple tips to help you improve the eating habits of your kids at home. So the first point that I wanna make is all about presenting foods in different ways. So for our example, I have a plate of broccoli prepared three different ways. You can see I have some raw broccoli, some steamed broccoli, and then some roasted broccoli. Each of these vegetables is gonna have a different taste and a different texture. And for kids to explore and try new foods, we want them to be able to explore those different tastes and textures. So before you give up on maybe broccoli, ask yourself, have you tried preparing it different ways? Have you tried preparing it with different seasonings or sauces and have you uh, presented it to them multiple times because it will take a couple different tries before your kid might be open to trying a different food. So try it out and uh, see how it goes. All right, so the next activity here that I have to present to you is called Mashed Potato Mountain. Now, when your kids are trying new foods, there's more to just tasting a new food than the taste. It can be about the smell, it can be about the texture and the flavor. So, I want you to give your kids an opportunity to explore all of those things. So here is a great example of an activity that you can set up for your kids. I call this mashed potato mountain. So what I did was I boiled a sweet potato and I boiled um, a regular potato. So I made sweet mashed potatoes and regular mashed potatoes. And you could flavor them however you normally would at home. I let them cool down a little bit and I could set up my kid in my high chair or at the table and let them get messy. You can see that I have some broccoli florets as trees. We even have little plastic toys um, like this steamroller and a dinosaur that the kids can play with, use their imagination. If the kids were in the kitchen here with me, I would read them a story about volcanoes. I would ask them to make different shapes. You can ask them what color is a potato? What does it smell like? Give them an opportunity to use all their different senses and that will help them take the steps to try the new food. If you have kids um, that are really bothered by different textures and feels, let them put little plastic baggies or little gloves over their hands so that they can touch the food, but in a way that feels okay on their hands. It will be a little messy and that's okay. Um, it will help those kids learn and explore. Set some time aside to do just that. All right, for our final way to help kids explore more food and try new foods, one of the best tips that I can give you is get them involved in cooking. So today we're gonna make a little cucumber tomato salad um, with our own dressing, and I'm gonna show you how you can do this with kids. So one great, great tool you can use in the kitchen with kids are these child safe knives. So this will not cut you, but it works well enough that you can cut some different vegetables. So especially soft vegetables, like a zucchini, or of course these tomatoes right here, it works pretty well. So for this recipe, we are going to um, cut these tomatoes in half. And of course the recipe will be posted at the end of the video. And then we will add them to our bowl. Next, what we're gonna do is we'll take our avocado, and you can see I already opened it and scored it, and that's gonna make it really easy to scoop out. So this is great, again, for little hands to help you with. You just take a spoon, guide it along the bottom, and your avocado will come out. Now, when you're choosing an avocado, um, sometimes it can be pretty tricky and sometimes it requires a little luck, but you want it to be just soft and it will be ready to go.
Now, just like I mentioned before, we want those different textures. So a great way to explore different textures is with a veggie spiralizer. So it looks something like this. You can get them online. You can get them in a lot of stores. So I have an English cucumber. I'm using an English cucumber because they have less seeds. And you can keep the skin on, no need to peel it. All you do is twist it. And your cucumber is gonna come out in these strands, right? So a different texture for your kids to explore and a different tool for them to use. This doesn't take much strength, doesn't take much dexterity, so a child can absolutely use this. Now, the blades can be a little sharp, so especially when you get close to the nub, um, you're gonna want them to move slowly and watch their fingers, but otherwise, this is a great tool to use. So we'll just finish that off and we can add that right into our salad bowl. And then finally, I just have a can of corn here that is drained and rinsed that I'm also going to add to our salad bowl. I'm not gonna add the whole thing just because I'm just making a little salad today. Again, the recipe will be posted. And while you could absolutely use a different vinaigrette at home that you might have like a bottle, I'm gonna show you just how easy it is to make it. Okay, so the next part of our salad, we're going to make the vinaigrette or the dressing that is gonna go over it. Now this is very simple, just lemon juice, olive oil, cilantro, salt, and pepper. Now a tool that you can use, especially if you have little guys, is something like a citrus juicer like this. Um, Squeezing a lemon can take a little muscle. So if your kids are older, this is, you know, by all means, just let them use it with their hands. This will really help get out a lot of the juice. So all we have is some lemon juice and it takes all the seeds out. So I'm gonna add that in. I'm just gonna add a little salt and pepper, a great uh, job for little kids to do, especially watch them a little bit <laughs> during this. And then we're gonna add about a tablespoon of this is like partially dried cilantro that you can find in the produce section. Now, I'm gonna slowly add my olive oil while I mix another great job for little hands. Final step, we're gonna add our dressing right into the bowl. And then again, we're gonna toss it. Another great job for little hands. Make sure everything is nice and distributed. Now I can't make any guarantees, but typically when the child helps prepare the food, they are more likely to try it. So give this a shot at home and hopefully it goes well for you. Thanks for joining. And I wanted to say real quick before we move on to the next slide, um, this is a presentation that we can send out. So if anybody is interested in having the recipe, we can absolutely send this out to you. And I also wanted to add that, um, so that mashed potato mountain, um, actually when, uh, Emily and I were developing that picky eating class that she teaches at um, our teaching kitchen. We referenced a book by a speech therapist. Her name is Melanie Potok, and the book is called Adventures in Veggie Land. And it's an awesome book. It gives you so many different fun ideas of how to use food in a fun way. Um, so I can get you a link to that book as well. Um, and then that way, if you're interested in looking at it. All right. So. Here's the most important thing. Hey, Emily, are you muted by chance? I'm getting some feedback. Um, I actually was I muted. I actually was muted. Okay, that's all right. I was just asking. Okay, maybe it's on my end. So um, the most important thing is that this is a process. Improvement takes time and you may not see success right away. So celebrate the small steps like we talked about earlier. You know, I can tolerate having a, a veggie on my plate or I'm willing to lick this food. Um, 
but be happy with the small progress. And I think the most important thing is to trust the process. Um, it, it can feel really exhausting and really daunting and just really like, I can't keep up with this anymore, you know, over time. Um, but each child kind of gets into their own way and they learn what the, the meal schedule and the meal rules are. And they, um, you know, they'll, they'll get it over time. They'll understand. And, um, you know, it's, it, it takes practice. So be calm, be patient, give yourself a lot of, you know, grace and just take your time with it. That's the best advice I can give you. And I'll be thinking about all of you because, you know, I've been there. My, um, my two-year-old cried on the floor for 45 minutes when I gave him chili. And that was like the worst day ever because that's my favorite food. But it's okay because he'll eat a few bites of it now. So we, <laughs> you know, again, it's taken some time, but just, just be patient and it, and it will get better. Um, and I did have a few more kind of tips and thoughts that I wanted to add, especially as I was listening to the video. Um, there, I, I really want, when I say, you know, trust the process, also trust that your child knows how much to eat and knows their hunger and fullness. I mean, that's something we really want to encourage. So when we're trying to get our kids to eat one more bite, take more bite, bite, no, eat more food here, that's kind of counterproductive to that concept that I want my child to eat when they're hungry and stop when they're full. You know, that's the skill we want them to carry into adulthood. So trust that, you, that your child knows when to stop. Um, and if you have any concerns, you know, is my child not getting the right vitamins and minerals and nutrients? Are they not growing appropriately? Take that all to your, you know, to their pediatrician. Um, if I have families that I'm working with, I tell them, I, I always go through the growth chart. I always explain, you know, if there's growth concerns, we talk about it, but most of the time there's not. And I just tell them, take that burden off of your plate. Let me be the one to watch how your child is growing. Don't put that in your mind and don't let that be the thing that's driving this change. Trust that they know how to feed themselves and that your responsibility is just to give them, you know, what they, what they need and, and to set the schedule and the environment. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is kids, especially younger kids, the younger they are, the less likely they really don't know if they like or don't like a food. Um, I, it can take 20 or more tries of a food to really know if you like something or not. And I'm sure you've all experienced this where, you know, especially if your child's a little bit older, you know, they liked something as a baby, but then they didn't like it for a little bit, but now they're willing to eat it again, but we're kind of phasing out of it. That's, that's not really like or dislike. Sometimes it's more about, I prefer these other foods more and I just don't want this one right now. And, you know, that's okay. Keep offering. Just make sure that they always are seeing that food. Um, because if you stop offering it, you know, say you don't offer peas for a year. And then all of a sudden your child, it's on their plate. They're like, what is this? What am I going to, I'm not going to eat this. You've never offered this to me before. Why are you doing it now? You know, so consistently offering back to that division of responsibility, your, your role is to offer the food. So consistently offer it, offer small portions if you need to. So there's not a lot of food waste and just give them some time. And I, I saw a really interesting thing. I can't take credit for this concept, but, um, you know, foods, convenience foods, for example, will always taste the exact same way. If you're eating a Cheez-It, you could buy 50 boxes of Cheez-Its and they all are going to taste exactly the same. But blueberries don't taste the same every 50 time that you buy it in the grocery store. Some are mushy, some are crispy, some are more tart, some are more sweet. And so, you know, especially fruits and vegetables, that's hard for kids because there is not a consistent flavor. There's not a consistent texture. And it's a guessing game sometimes. And they could have had a really sour blueberry last time. And they're like, oh, I don't want a sour one this time. But they have a hard time understanding when you say, no, this is a really good blueberry. You'll like it. It's hard for them to kind of cognitively, their development might not be there to understand that type of reasoning. Um, 
so just keep offering and, and it'll eventually come around to that. Um, and I wanted to touch on one more thing. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Um, I know some of you had some kids that were a little bit older than that toddler age. So I do want to touch on that a little bit and give you something that could be helpful for them. Um, anytime that I've worked with um, kids anywhere between maybe six to like 10, 11 years old, I really encourage them to be critical thinkers when they're eating. So for example, if they, if you put a food in front of them and they say, I don't like that. I always tell that child and I speak specifically to them. I say, you know, instead of saying, I don't like that, tell you, the person who served it to you what you don't like about it. I don't like that it's crunchy. I don't like that it's squishy. I don't like that it's bitter. We can change those things. And I think especially vegetables are so versatile. You know, you could have them raw, you can have them cooked, you can cook them in stews, you can add spices, seasonings, dips. We can change what you don't like. Just tell me what you don't like. And so one, it brings them into that eating process. It, it really empowers them to make their own choices, but it's not about, oh, this is healthy, this isn't healthy. It's about, tell me what I can change. That way you'd be more willing to eat it. And then I also tell that child too, same rules apply. We can, we really don't know if we like a food until we try it 20, 30, 40, even 50 times. So I always tell that child, you're not allowed to say, I don't like a food until you've tried it at least 20 times. So what you can say instead is, I'm still practicing to like this food. And that's okay. Yeah, but at least they're acknowledging that I don't care for it today, but I'm willing to still work on it. So hopefully all of those things help. And please feel free, if you have any questions, type them in, um, enter them in the chat box, whatever it might be. Yeah, so any questions, chat box, Nearpod, um, we'll definitely check out both. You can chat them out. We're a relatively small group here. I think we can handle that too. You know, and one question I have just generally for the group is based on the video and the different things that Kylie has talked about, do these feel like reasonable suggestions for things for you to try at home? I think so. I mean, I think so personally, personally as a parent. Personally as a parent. I definitely had learned something new, like the, um, you know, not removing the native conversations and behavior I had like we're, we're doing everything wrong <laughs> so um that was really informative and I'm I'm excited to try it because it seems so obvious I guess of how to turn it around so um I really like that little tip at least for me and um and um Somebody just wrote privately. Somebody just wrote privately. To me. Any advice on getting any advice sweet tooth under control? We control. are in a pattern of a we sweet after dinner, dinner, which leads to eating less dinner. dinner. Absolutely. Okay. And I had someone also send to me um, privately negative sibling influence. So I'll touch on both of those things. And one thing I did want to say, you know, thank you for pointing out the one thing that works or that you want to try at home. I named so many different things and it don't feel overwhelmed like oh i have to do all of this right now pick the one thing that you think might be the biggest area to work on or the biggest change and start there and then add these different little things in if needed and as you can so it doesn't feel so daunting and overwhelming um so let's touch on the sweet tooth first so i'm gonna present kind of an idea that i feel like sounds really crazy when i say it out loud but let's rationalize through it um a lot of times our dessert foods, our kind of ready-made convenience foods, things that, you know, people might quote call junk food. I don't love that term, but I think we all know what we're, we mean when I say that. A lot of times we will place those or give those items as rewards or at the end of a meal or at a time where I get this because I did something right. Um, so 
a couple of different kind of feeding philosophies or, or concepts that you can try is one, serve your dessert food with the meal. Don't put it at the end because the child either, there's two ways it can go. I'm not gonna eat as much at dinner because I know I'm gonna get something later that will fill me up. Or two, I'm gonna overeat at that meal in order to earn that dessert food at the end of the meal. And so now the food at the meal time, especially the vegetables, a lot of times become the negative food because I have to eat these in order to get the thing I like. So put just a little piece of that dessert food, that sweet item with the meal. Make sure that portion is really, really small so that they're not filling up on it. But now that food is on the same level. It's on the same podium and it's not on a higher podium. Your child is likely gonna eat that food first. I mean, just expect that to happen. Um, but, you know, I don't have to earn anything to get to that. And it's not such a big amount that it's ruined that meal. It can kind of desensitize the, um, uh, you know, the desire for those foods. Another thing that I've seen other people suggest, um, I'm still working on this one myself at home, is having moments where you allow your child unlimited access to that food. And the idea behind that concept is those foods probably feel restricted to that child, you know, right now. And so we always want these foods because there's a limit or a restriction. So if maybe, you know, once a month, once every two months, just let your child eat as many as they want. There's no limits, there's no stop. Now they maybe don't feel as, you know, restricted of that food item because they've had opportunities for free reign. And I know that sounds kind of crazy and, you know, a little out there. I've tried it a few times. I tried it on Halloween this past year with my kids and I said, how's much you want? I don't care. Eat the whole bag. Go for it. Um, my son ate, I mean, he ate probably seven or eight pieces of candy, that was, you know, but then he stopped. He was full and he's like, thanks mom, I'm done. And I think my two-year-old ate like four pieces and she was done. So they still know how to limit themselves and how to stop. Um, I think the number of times you offer that free access is really up to you and what feels most comfortable to you. Okay, the other thing was negative sibling influence. This is a really, really hard one. <laughs> this one's really hard. Um, it it kind of depends on the age of the sibling and maybe what it is that they're doing to be a negative influence. You know, if they're making comments like, oh, this is gross, ew, I don't like it, ew, you won't like it, um, I would say the same thing, you know, ignore those behaviors or maybe even ask that child, you know, pull them off to the side and say, hey, you know, we really want to get, you know, your sibling to be more open, to eat more variety of foods. And I know that you're still working on liking some of these foods, but can your job be to help me teach your sibling how to be a better eater at these foods? Kind of give them the responsibility to, um, you know, take over that job of being the influence. And I know that understanding and that rationalization is tough if the sibling, you know, my kids are, um, you know, three and five. So my five-year-old's not gonna understand that concept, but if you have a, you know, maybe a five-year-old and a 10-year-old, that 10-year-old may be better able to understand, okay, my job here is to just not say anything negative, you know, and, and keep it to myself. And then if I don't like something after a meal, I can talk about it with mom or dad and tell them my opinions about that food away from the other sibling. Kylie, in the chat, we had somebody ask, what do we do when they gag over the food? Um, and somebody also just mentioned, I have tried the dessert on the plate and I think it does work. They eat it first, but they did try other things on the plate. So thank you for both of those. So the gag question. Yes, thank you for the, the comment about the de, um, having the dessert with the meal. So the gagging is tough and um, you know, it kind of depends without having any specific details. This is one of those situations where I might, if I were working with, with somebody one on one, I might ask more specific questions. Um, they probably learn that if they gag, that food's going to go away. Um, if they're gagging, but they're not choking, or, you know, if it's 
I mean, we can gag and it's still safe. Just ignore it. But if that child is gagging to the point where they are um, choking, you know, that's, you may want to take that to their pediatrician and just have some deeper conversations about it. Um, another thing too is, are they gagging on specific foods or specific texture types of foods? I have with, worked with some kids who have extra sensitivities to texture and no matter how hard they try to eat that food, as soon as it touches their mouth, it immediately hits that gag reflex because they're overly sensitive to a specific type of texture or food consistency. And that also requires um, a little bit different intervention and something that I would say, take that to the pediatrician to talk about a little bit more. Um, and I think, you know, one thing to keep in mind, at least at Dayton Children's, we have a nutrition clinic. Um, we have six different dietitians in that clinic, and it's just a one on one appointment with a dietitian to talk about these concerns. So, again, if you feel like, you know, if my child gags once or twice, I've kind of learned that it's really just a, a behavior response, I can manage it and ignore it. That's what I would suggest. If you feel like, it requires some deeper diving, some more conversation. Look, take it to your pediatrician, look into the option of nutrition clinic. We can investigate it further and see if maybe there's more going on than, um, you know, just a simple behavior response. Sorry, I have one more question. Um, what do you do though if the child, um, if the child says they won't eat and they don't eat anything, do you just send them off to bed without eating any dinner or do you give them something else that they will like? That's a great question. Yeah, I get asked that a lot. Um, so the division of responsibility would say if that child doesn't eat, then they don't eat. And if it's bedtime, then they go to bed. Um, I also realize that's kind of <laughs> very harsh. Um, so it really depends on the situation. Um, again, a personal example, you know, we, we eat dinner early in my house, usually 530. And then my kids go to bed around 738. So if one of my kids doesn't eat dinner, but then they say they're hungry, we have enough time in between that I will reoffer what they didn't eat for dinner. And then usually they eat dinner at that point. Now, if you eat dinner later, say we eat dinner at 7.30 and your child goes to bed at 8, um, there's a couple of different things. Um, again, the division of responsibility would say if they don't eat, then they go to bed. They'll probably be extra hungry in the morning and want a bigger breakfast. You could, if you're you know, really struggling, sometimes I'll tell parents, offer a really small amount of an accepted food that you know that child will eat along with foods that they probably won't eat. So there's this balance at that meal of like, say they only eat chicken nuggets, but you're having tacos for dinner. That child gets the taco items, smaller quantities, but gets that, but then gets maybe two chicken nuggets with that meal too. And so that way you have this balance of, I know there's something there they will eat, but they still have this opportunity to eat other and new foods. So you can try either one, feel, decide which one feels more comfortable for you. And I, I'm just going to say this because Kylie has told me this many times. Like if if a child skips a meal occasionally, that is OK, right? If it's happening on a consistent basis, um, that could be, you know, cause for concern. But missing a meal once in a while is is OK. I, I completely agree with that. It is definitely OK. Keep an eye out on how often it's happening, but it is okay periodically. That's totally fine. Um, and and one thing to keep in mind too at meals, you know, kind of keep an eye out for how long that meal might be lasting. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that the meal is no longer than thirty minutes, because after thirty minutes, they're just not interested in eating anymore. And so, you know, if if we're sitting at the table for an hour and they're piddling around with their food and not really eating it. Let's tighten up that time a little bit and set the expectation that we're not going to play around here. Um, you know, we got 30 minutes, then the meal is over. And then if you're hungry, you can come back and eat what you didn't eat then. 
I know that's with my younger one. She's she's a real dragging her feet kind of eater. So we always have to set the rule. 30 minutes, look at the clock. When the clock says this time, you're done eating um, to kind of help them on pace and not, because what I had learned for her was if she drug her feet so much, then, you know, she'd probably end up getting something that, you know, I wasn't planning on giving somebody else because I'm just like, you're not eating, you got to eat something. And then I just give her something else. So we set meal limits. And then if she's hungry later, we come back and eat some more. Okay, so, okay, so, um, oops, I just got some feedback, got some feedback. Um, so we're running over time, but um, I do want to thank Kylie and Emily. That was so informative, especially um, just be as a mom. So I really appreciate all the time um, that you've taken to create the presentation and, and also do this presentation today. So if um, anyone has any other questions, can they send them to me and then I forward them on to you guys or, you know, I mean, are you open to that? I mean, are you open to it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You're more than welcome, more to, than do welcome to do um, that. Um, I was also going to, you know, say I can add right when we get off, I, I'm happy to send, we have like an at your own pace link for this lesson. I can send that and um, people can use it at their own pace and have access to it. Um, and Kylie was talking about like nutrition clinic. Like if you do have some concerns, um, I'm, you can just Google Dayton Children's Nutrition Clinic and that will come right up um, for you. And you could uh, have Kylie as your provider if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, we recently added self-scheduling so you don't have to go through your uh, pediatrician and get a referral. So uh, that's what Emily's referring to when she says just Google it. Um, it'll pop right up and you can schedule yourself if you want to. But um, yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to receive emails or any sort of con contact afterwards to answer any other questions. Great. My coworker just uh, just was <laughs> so excited when you said self-scheduling for that. So, <laughs> I think a lot of people will be happy about that. Um, okay. And then also I, I, would, I will send that link out then to people that couldn't attend today. Um, anyone that registered, I'll send it out because I understand things happen. It's the middle of a Saturday and it's really nice out. <laughs> so yeah, and I did put the link in the chat. Um, we do have that book, mm -hmm. Adventures in Veggie Land um, by Melanie, was it Pollock? And I can't remember the name, but we do have it here. But we do have it here in the library. library. Is it Melanie Pollock? So Melanie Melanie Pollock. Pollock. Yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. Okay. So we do have it at Centerville. We only have one copy, but we can also get it, um, get it through search Ohio for you. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thank that you. Was, that was great. Right. Bye Thank everybody. You. Bye. Thank you all for attending.